Good morning, church. There I am. Hi. Please stand and join me. Join up. Bye. 
and that you give us the ability to stand and worship you and just raise our arms high, whether it's really or in our hearts. Just help us to just totally focus on you and devote ourselves to worship. We love you. In your name, amen. You may be seated. just leading you, or being led by you step by step and uh, I, I pray that this is a demonstration of us following you all of our days. We love you. Amen.
Good morning, church. Uh, we sang some marvelous truths this morning, didn't we? And that we'll follow the Lord Jesus. We need his help, his grace, his strength to do that every day. But uh, we're so blessed to be able to come together. We know that the Holy Spirit empowers his church to, to live the lives that he's called us to live. And we have brothers and sisters around us that will support us and encourage us. Amen? Amen. And this is the blessing of the church family that we get to come together and uh, know that we're not alone. And that Jesus is in our midst and he's strengthening, he's, he's present in the midst of the churches. We're going through the churches in Revelation. Pastor Pat's going to be preaching on the church of Smyrna uh, in just a few minutes. And uh, knowing that Jesus has a word for each church. And uh, it's a word for the various churches in Revelation, but he has a word for us here today, too. And so we want to be ready for that this morning. Uh, just a few announcements. First, welcome. We have several guests here this morning, so welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you for being here. And uh, this is a great Sunday to be here for multiple reasons, but one of them is we're having a prime rib dinner downstairs right after the service. Uh, so we do invite you to come down for that. Um, if you say, hey, I didn't know anything about it, you are welcome to come. We would love for you to come down there. Um, it's going to be done a little bit different. We set up a few more tables to accommodate more people. And because of that, we're actually going to have everybody come and sit down, and then we're going to release table by table. So we won't have a long line. We're just going to table by table and release. So after the service, come on down, find a seat, and we will get you up and getting your, your food uh, as soon as we can. But I also want to encourage you to find, uh, use this as an opportunity to meet some new people. We have a lot of new faces in the church. We're so glad that you're here. But there's a lot of people who don't know each other. And part, this is a fellowship meal, and that means that we're, we're wanting to connect and fellowship with new people. So perhaps find a few people that you don't know as well and, and sit next to them, introduce yourself, and uh, let's get to spread out and uh, get to know some more people in this church. We're going to look, look to do that uh, for the meal today. Sonia? Um, so a ladies' luncheon, what was the date again? 11 o'clock on the 25th here at the church. What day of the week is that? Saturday. Saturday. So. Okay, ladies' luncheon, Saturday the 25th, 11 o'clock. Uh, home group will be here tonight or tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. We have the meal and then uh, worship, Bible teaching, small groups. Um, it's for young adults, but it's really for those that are young at heart as well. But I encourage you to consider coming to that. House-to-house uh, -house groups come along, aren't they? And uh, yeah, we have uh, first week already, so thank you all again, our hosts and group leaders that are doing that, all the participants, um, excited to hear the reports uh, coming back on those. And last, or Friday night, we had our ki another kids' night at the church here. We don't have any pictures, that might be a good thing, I don't know, but uh, the kids are having a great time, and the adults are getting to know the kids, and the parents are getting out on dates and other things too, so those, that's been just really good. Um, and then uh, one more announcement before we send the little ones down. And Nathan, if you can show the picture up there. So Elsie McKinney is uh, part of our congregation, of course, and is a local author and has just uh, written a book. Where is Elsie? Up there. Okay. All right. She's up there. So she's having a book signing. And what makes this, I think, doubly uh, cool is that it's going to be held at the Lost Village Pierogi Place, which Mike and Holly uh, it's their, their business. And so uh, that'll be this Saturday, 12 to 3. Come and support Elsie in her new book. Uh, it's awesome. All right, at this time, we'll have our little ones head down to nursery. So five and under for nursery. And um, I'm going to pray. For, and then uh, Pastor Pat's going to come up and share the word. Revelation chapter 2, uh, looking at the uh, second church that we have. So let's pray together. Uh, Father, we just uh, thank you again for being able to gather, to worship, Lord, for all those that you brought here this morning. Uh, we know that uh, some of you have been, some have been serving for many years, Lord, and, and some maybe are, are brand new and checking things out. But uh, Lord, that we know that your spirit has uh, drawn us uh, to, to you this morning, Lord. We pray as, as our hearts have been humbled, we ask uh, that they have been and in uh, the word and through the message and the music and just your presence here, Lord. We pray you continue to draw those to you. and Let us be yielded and receptive to all that you have. We pray that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us here this morning. 
Uh, we're thankful, Lord, that we can gather, and Lord, that we know apart from you that that um, uh, we would be in darkness and, and blinded to the truths of your scriptures. But through your Holy Spirit, Lord, you have opened our eyes and that we can see. So we just pray, Lord, that we would um, that we be understanding, Lord, of these truths and help us to apply them to our lives. We thank you, Lord, that it's the living word and that as the word is shared here this morning, uh, we know that it has uh, power through you to change our hearts and to change our lives. So, Lord, um, uh, have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Good morning, everybody. A little housekeeping before we start. Seth, where are you? Seth, you're killing the drums, and I appreciate you playing, especially when I have to preach, because it's one last thing I have to do. The drums were donated recently. It's a big upgrade. You know who you are if you contributed, so big thanks to that, and a big thanks to Seth. Thanks, man. Um, we're getting into the letter to the church in Smyrna this morning, and I wanted to start out by reading it. It's a very short letter to the church, so let's read it. It's in Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 8. So the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last, the one who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. First song we sang this morning, um, The Battle Belongs. Now, as an American Christian here in Petoskey, you might sing that and think, well, there's not really that much of a battle going on here. I don't really need to fight the devil all the time. I don't really need to um, get engaged in certain battles and feel like I'm always waging warfare. And for the most part, I think you could live a decent Christian life um, without giving too much credit to the devil, okay? But as you see to the church in Smyrna here, the devil has actually given a certain pass to attack the church with imprisonment and maybe even death. So when we sing it, it might not seem like there's that much of a battle. Your battle may be some of your emotional issues. Your battle may be a relationship issue or fi financial things. Um, there are people around the world who would sing that song with such power and such conviction, knowing that their battle 100% belongs to God because they're at the mercies of people who want to kill them and persecute them. Um, so I just wanted to put that in perspective first as we get into the church in Smyrna, because it might just give us a new appreciation for the battle that is the Christian life. In Smyrna, there was a pastor named Polycarp. Anybody heard of Polycarp? If you're a church history nerd, you've probably heard of Polycarp. He had little education, and he was not wise by the world's standards, but he converted many from Gnosticism and defended the church from false teachers. In his writings, he referenced the gospel, some of the writings of Paul and his letters to the churches, and he helped reinforce the church's beliefs that the death and resurrection of Jesus was not merely a uh, mirage or an imaginary phenomenon, as the Gnostics believed at the time, but it was a real story about a real God who became a real man, died a real death, and was raised to real life, um, and was really ascended to heaven for us. Before he was martyred for his faith, a Roman proconsul told him if he cursed Christ, he could live. Curse Christ, and I'll let you live. And Polycarp answered, 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How could I blaspheme my king and my savior? And that really is a good example of the way the church in Smyrna operated. Polycarp's life was an example of the par for the course, you could say, of Smyrna. We're going to run through the history of Smyrna really quick. So there's that first slide, Nathan, the seven letters to the seven churches with the small map on there. Pastor Mark covered Ephesus last week. You'll see that's number one. Just north of it is Smyrna, just about 50 miles, just under 50 miles north. Um, Acts 19, Paul spent two years in Asia preaching and lecturing for about two and a half, three years. It says, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jews and Greeks. You won't see any other mention of Smyrna in the Bible outside of Revelation. 
Uh, but Acts 20 did tell us that Paul departed from Macedonia after the riot in Ephesus. So if Ephesus is number one, he would have traveled directly north and then west around the Aegean Sea to get into Macedonia, which is in the um, upper left there. Would have taken him right to Smyrna, would have taken him right past Smyrna, that route. Smyrna was a small port, a big small port city on a small peninsula in the Aegean Sea, estimated to have a population of 100,000 people. And I have to correct Pastor Mark for the way he pronounced Smyrna this morning, because it's extremely embarrassing for him. Um, the, city gets, the city gets its name from the Greek word for myrrh. So if you look at the Greek word for myrrh, it is S-M-U-R-N-A. So I think it should be Smyrna. But I think God probably doesn't care that much about how we pronounce it. So obviously, it could be. I don't know. Perfume used for anointing myrrh was brought by the wise men to Jesus, obviously, at his birth. It was brought to him at his death by Nicodemus. Um, and so that is the connection with the name of Smyrna. There has been little excavation done at the modern city Izmir in Turkey. Um, it's the third largest population in Turkey today, and little remains of the ancient city other than that. So the first one, I want to show you the Agora in Smyrna, or in Izmir today. That's the first one. The Agora would have been a meeting place, a big marketplace. Um, that's one of the first things that they've excavated, one of the few main things they've even been able to excavate. Um, the second one, Nathan, is the theater. So this is pretty cool. You can see how big of a city it is. So it was built upon so quickly that they haven't been able to dig too much cool stuff up. But this is pretty cool. So you can see how big the city is. Um, and then this is one of the amphitheaters that would have been there from Rome. Uh, the one in Ephesus, if you remember the photo from last week, was much, much larger. Um, but that's one of them there. The third one might be the coolest. It's this Roman aqueduct that was taking a picture. That's still there to transfer the water across the valley there. Um, and this, I can't remember when this photo was taken, but a news article about it there. So it was a very um, productive, active city. Um, and it's only one of the two churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus wrote to that had zero corrections for. He had nothing to correct them on. He told the church in Sardis he was going to come against them like a thief in the night. He called the church in Laodicea lukewarm, that he was going to spew them out of his mouth. He told the church in Thyatira that they have tolerated that woman Jezebel, and if they don't repent, he's going to strike her children dead. For Smyrna, it's sunshine and rainbows from Jesus, until you read the rest of the letter. It's not quite sunshine and rainbows, because they have hardships coming their way. Jesus chose this church as one of the seven to write to. We don't always know why, but these are the seven. He wrote to the angel of the church. Pastor Mark mentioned it last week. The Greek word for angel simply means messenger. So this, we can assume this is probably some sort of envoy for John who is carrying the letters or maybe even the pastor of the church. And we're going to get into his words for the church here. Chapter 2, verse 8. The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. So I was looking up a lot of the verses in the scriptures where Jesus references himself as the first and the last, and we all think toward the end of Revelation where he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He calls himself about that about a half a dozen times throughout the book of Isaiah, and he's actually calling himself that for the second time in Revelation. When he showed himself to John at the, in the beginning, in the first chapter, he said, I am the first and the last, and now he chooses to identify himself that way to this church specifically. It's cool to look at the way Jesus decides to open up and to describe himself to each church because it might just give you a hint as to what he's planning on doing for them or the way he wants to encourage them. Excuse me. Chapter 2, verse 9. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. So the Christians in Smyrna were apparently poor, and being in this flourishing city on a seaport, you can assume that their poverty was a direct result of their faith. Who knows that you can take a financial hit for your belief in Jesus. There's certain businesses you may not get involved in. There's certain clients that might not take you because of your beliefs. There's certain uh, just deals you may not make because of your Christian convictions. Smyrna was known as the glory of Asia and had a status of commercial greatness. Yet Jesus identifies with them and says, I see your poverty. If he was writing to anybody other than the Christians, if he was writing to the Romans, if he was writing to some of the Jews... He may not have said, I see your poverty. He would have seen their riches, their financial, their material riches. But to Smyrna, 
to the Christians in Smyrna, excuse me, he says, I see your poverty, and I know your tribulation. Mingled in Smyrna's commercial success was something else common in the Roman-controlled cities, which would have been worship of the emperor, pagan worship of the emperor, and other idols, I'm sure. The Roman emperor at the time was Domitian. He was well known for his cruelty and his confiscation of public property. He might just come take your land. He might just come take your house. He might just come take your family. And uh, the history says that he's even known for executing two of his cousins for not staying in line. So... If your cousin's the emperor, you better shape up. Born-again Christians now had a heart to turn from hailing the emperor as God, right? They didn't want to hail Emperor Domitian as Lord. And now that they didn't, it was potentially going to lead to a loss of their lives, and it would sure lead to a loss of income or property if you were not going to bend the knee. This was the pagan world they had to face. Now, we can get caught up in the difficulties of our time, We can feel sad for ourselves and shed a little tear for the hard things that we have to face. And I'm not trying to diminish them. I'm just trying to put it in perspective for us. We can really take, you know, we get really caught up in some of the hardships of our time, whether it's pro-abortion legislation or different sexual revolutions that are permeating our education and our entertainment. Maybe we're feeling sorry for ourselves because of the perspectives that other people have on us at school, at work, and and, in society, that we're going against the, the mainstream Uh, theory of the culture, we're going against that, and now we're facing criticism and ridicule. Well, they're not taking our our property from us yet, are they? Yet. So we we can take it as it comes and put it in perspective and say, thank you, Jesus, that we can be that much more productive for you now. The Christians in Smyrna faced direct threats to if they were going to have a roof over the head, if they were going to be able to feed their families the next day. But in Christ's eyes, they were rich. And what an encouraging footnote that is from Christ there in in parentheses in your Bible, probably. But you are rich. I know and I see your poverty, but in my eyes, you're rich. Nathan, if you put Revelation 2.16 up there, please. The church in Laodicea got something direct opposite said to them. Jesus said, for you say, I am rich. Is that 2.16? It might not be the right one. Let me see. Verse 9 in Laodicea? Or, I'm sorry. Let me find it, just a second. 2.17, please. 3.17, I'll read it. <laughs> I didn't put it up there. I got the wrong chapter. All right, Jesus says to Laodicea, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So they thought they were rich. They thought they had it off. They, had, they were well off. Jesus said, I see you as poor, pitiable, wretched, blind, and naked. But the Christians in Smyrna, you guys are rich. So clearly, there is a spiritual element to this. And Jesus sees the physical state and the spiritual state of your life far different than the world does. The church in Sardis of chapter 3, Jesus said they had a reputation of being alive, yet they were dead. Jesus is seeing things differently for us. And I love these paradoxes. I think they are wonderful because it is encouraging for you. If today you are sick, if you're sick in here, if you have a disease, an ailment, In Christ's eyes, in his church, in his spirit, you are well. You are well. Whether he decides to heal you of your body, malady or not, you are well in Jesus. One day we will all die. If you've been born again, if you love Jesus, if you've put your faith in him, as as Billy Graham said, you will be more alive than ever once you die. And those are the paradoxes of the Christian life. Let's continue through chapter 2, verse 9. The second thing he says, I know your tribulation and your poverty and the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Harsh words there. So the financial hardships from the pagan world in Smyrna um, brought from standing up for Jesus were not the only trials facing this church as they were also dealing with slander from the religious world. Well, that's a bummer. I thought as a Christian, it would only be the pagan Romans who would give me trouble. I thought it would just be the pagan state who would give me trouble. I didn't think these other religious groups would cause me trouble. I thought we were all on the same team here. Well, no, Jesus is creating a very stark contrast, a very strong discrepancy between those who follow Jesus and those who don't, whether they profess God or not. So the unbelieving Jews are described in strong words, and this is not unlike the Bible to do. Uh, John the Baptist, when the Pharisees came out to him at the, when he was baptizing, he called them a brood of vipers. In John 8, Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. 
to the Pharisees. In Matthew 28, he called them blind guides, hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. They're full of dead men's bones. Christ is affirming to the church that the slandering of these Jews, their Jewishness, their lineage, had nothing to do with earning favor in God's eyes. It meant nothing without faith. In John 8 again, Jesus is sparring with the Pharisees. And they answered him and said, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. So your heritage is not cutting it for you. Paul said in Romans 9, 6, not all who have descended from Israel are Israel. So could it be that your genealogy does not earn you a free pass into the favor of God? 100% it does not. Even if you are the, the children of Abraham, the chosen promised people, if you are not putting your faith in Christ, it means nothing. And we, as most of us, I assume, as Gentiles have been grafted in, we are grateful that, that God has done that. In the, in the scriptures, it says it was even done to make the Jews jealous that they might repent and come to Christ. But could it be that just because you profess a part in God's people, he could, not, he could still not consider you of the devil? And that's what he says here. They are a synagogue of Satan. And we think words like satanic, demonic, maybe it was a show at the Grammys, or maybe it was something yet. No, if you're apart from Christ, if you, if you reject the gospel, that's of Satan. And the Jews here were slandering the Christians for believing what they believed. And we don't always see stuff like that as satanic or demonic or of the devil, but it really is. What could be more of the devil than a lie that could keep somebody from coming to Jesus? And that is the situation that was happening here. So after Jesus tells the Jews back in John 8 that though they are Abraham's offspring, he is not truly their father, they say, well, we have one father. It's God the Father. And Jesus says this, if, you, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he who sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. If you profess God as your father, you must love Jesus. You might not be a, a person born Jewish here today, but if you profess to love God, to be a Christian, to be part of the church, the household of God, you have to love Jesus. It doesn't matter if your parents raised you in church, and it doesn't matter if you know a few hymns by heart. The, the, the standard is faith in Christ. I would encourage you to meditate on 1 John, especially chapter 5, where he says, I write these things that you may know you have eternal life. Secure that between you and Jesus. And if, you, if there are people who profess God as their father and are slandering you for staying faithful to the word of God, bear it strong like the Christians in Smyrna did. Let's continue. Verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And we'll get into that 10 days here in a second. But do not fear what you're about to suffer. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So how about that? A church with no corrections being told they're going to be attacked directly by the devil. These are some of the promised perks to faithful and courageous Christians in your life that Jesus might just say the devil's going to throw you into prison. Imprisonment, potential death promised to the faithful church in Smyrna. Now, you may have heard the Christian saying, and if this is kind of what you subscribe to, I'm not fully against it, but we'll see. God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. Well, how, do you, how many people do you know that aren't very strong soldiers of God that are going through a lot of hard stuff? And that's an encouraging way to say, hey, the reason that's happening is because God knows how strong you are. That's why he gave it to you. And I'm not saying that uh, people like Job in the scriptures or the martyrs throughout Christian history or, the, or some of the martyrs in Smyrna were not tough soldiers of God. I think a lot of them were. Um, but what if the case was that God doesn't allow the toughest battle, that God allows the toughest battles maybe to his most, most faithful soldiers, the people that are going to see the good come from it and the productivity and the growth in Christ that can come through some of those tests. The spiritual warfare of our days is confirmed here when Jesus says to make, he says, it, he doesn't say the Romans are going to throw you into prison. He doesn't say the Jews are going to hand you over to the Romans and then there's going to be some imprisonment. He says the devil's going to throw you into prison. So he's being very clear about this. You might say, well, God wouldn't let Satan attack me. I'm a child of God. He's not coming my way. And you can balance that a little bit. 
I think we do have authority to push him away. Remember, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. But he didn't say, hey, the devil's going to throw you guys into prison, so make sure you do that submit to God, resist thing, and then maybe you can get out. There's a balance here. He was saying, he's going to throw you in, and I'm, and I'm allowing it. And we see this throughout the scripture. Satan is the one that attacked Job, right? It wasn't just armies that came and destroyed his property. Satan attacked him. In Luke 13, this is an interesting one. Behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Jesus said, And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? I'm not sure. Every single thing, does, does Satan just cause physical maladies on people? Maybe. Uh, but Jesus had seen that as uh, the legitimate situation for her, and he loosed her from it. Paul had a thorn in his flesh that he called the messenger of Satan to buffet him. And even after the Last Supper, it says Satan entered Judas to go betray Jesus, which was one of the key steps in Jesus being crucified, right? Satan entered Judas. Now, I don't have an answer for all of the inner workings of every one of those verses. It is above me, it is beyond me to know how God works and his sovereignty over the devil. Um, but it is clear to see that even if you are a faithful church, even if we are a faithful church, the devil can attack us. And he does. I think, I think we'd be blind to not, to not see it from time to time. It's not that he just allows it. It almost seems like he's overseeing it. Like he, he's almost actively involved in it. But it's all in order to work for the good of the individual for his ultimate purpose. If one of the churches that Jesus has no corrections for in Revelation is the one that's going to be directly attacked by the devil, then we shouldn't be too comfortable and think we are invincible either. So instead of thinking, God wouldn't let Satan attack me, I think we could say, God wouldn't let Satan attack me for no purpose. I think that's a better view of looking at it. So let's ask ourselves. How could our church be tested? I like to think we do a pretty good job here. I like to think we have some good holy saints in this church. I think we do some good faithful ministry in the community. We're no Smyrna. Jesus might have a correction for us. I don't know. Um, but how could our church be tested, even maybe by Satan? I'll let you think about that for a second. How could our church in Petoskey, Michigan or the Church of, of Petoskey, or the Church of America, however you want to look at it, but let's, let's get a little more local with it. How could we be attacked even by Satan? And I think there's going to be more coming. Here's a couple ideas I had. There could be future, future um, ostracization for people holding to biblical values about life and sexuality. There could be governmental punishment and fines for bigotry or hate speech. Now, I'm not going to bring all this stuff up to make your blood boil. I'm going to bring it up for a second. I read an article from the Associated Press the other day saying that there was a Montana bill that would allow students to misgender classmates. It would allow students to misgender classmates. So we've reached a point in our country where the most innocent among us, children, school children, need legislation to protect them for being labeled, labeled bigot, bigots and bullies for using somebody's biological gender. If they're willing to go at, and there's, people are very, very upset about this, actually, that, that they would allow such bullying in the schools, but they needed protected legislation to be able to go to school and adhere to reality. If they are willing to go after innocent school children, a 10-year-old middle school girl needs legislation to protect her from being labeled a bigot. What will they do to us as the church? as many of us, fully grown men and women who want to serve God in the community and want to be able to worship freely and publicly here in our church, what will they do to us? Will there be legislation to protect us like there will be for these school children? Maybe in Montana, but maybe not in Michigan. If the world is willing to go after school children for misgendering students, do you think that the church could be immune forever? Smyrna was punished for not bowing the knee to the emperor Domitian. You and, I may, you and I might just be punished and tested for not bowing the knee to whatever the culture throws our way in the coming years. If the highest form of self-expression is sexual preference and gender identity, and you have the audacity to say that those don't reach the standard of what God has called good and reality, then that just may end up one day being a human rights violation, or maybe even terrorism. 
Are we ready to be tested that way? Like I said, I didn't bring that up to make you sad or to make your blood boil. I know if you watch the news enough, I'll, I'll, let it, I'll let it stay right there. But there is grace, joy, and reward in holding to the truths of Scripture. And we need to be ready to do that. Continuing in verse 10, it says, You will be tested for 10 days, and you will have tribulation. All right. Let's see how many people, what you all think about 10 days. There are four main positions on this 10 days number. Maybe it's 10 literal days. It, it depends on how literally you take the book of Revelation. It could be 10 literal days. It could be 10 major persecutions from 10 different Roman emperors. It could have been a 10-year persecution from the emperor Diocletian. Or, this is where I land personally, 10 is a symbolic number signifying a complete yet brief period of testing. He's going to be tested for 10 days. It's going to be brief, but it's going to be complete. And he gives them an encouragement in 2.10c, the last part. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus had introduced himself at the beginning, if you go back, the one who died and came to life. Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection is the key for us to, that made it possible for us to be faithful unto death. If he didn't do that, we would not be able to be faithful, and we definitely wouldn't be able to receive the crown of life. And this isn't necessarily eternal life itself. You have that when you're born again. But this crown of life is a very great reward for the endurance of suffering for the name of Jesus. And you see this in other places in the Bible. And we have a verse from James. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. A huge encouragement to keep going. And if it does get more difficult in the coming years for our church, bring it on in my book, because God has a crown of life waiting for us. It's been said the world crowns success, but God crowns faithfulness, and I agree with that. That crown may be ours soon. It might not. We don't know how difficult things would get. Regardless, we're called to be faithful until it's ours. As Peter said, when the chief shepherd appears, we will receive an unfading crown of glory. Maybe that's in our lifetime. We will see. We're going to serve faithfully until he does. Romans 2.11. Excuse me, Revelation 2.11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Revelation 20.14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. 21, verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Pretty horrible stuff that some people will suffer through. Jesus says, if you conquer your hardships, these horrors will not affect you. You're not going to be harmed by the second death. And that was the word for the church in Smyrna. You may suffer here under the punishment of the Roman rulers. You may endure the slander of the Jews who think that they're, they're, they're people of God, but they're actually of a synagogue of Satan. You may endure that, and it may feel like 10 days. But at the end of it, the second death is not going to hurt you. An eternal perspective to fix and to ease the um, temporary worries and pains of this life. The worship team wants to join me up here, and we'll finish up. If there's anything to take home from the church in Smyrna, it is that faithfulness to God might just bring you the perks of suffering, imprisonment, and maybe even death. That is your take home today. This short letter brings us quickly through the process of suffering and testing to victory. Here as a Christian, you might suffer through poverty, slander, attacks from Satan, imprisonment, or death, but you won't be hurt by the second death. And that's what matters. You won't have to suffer the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And if you go back to chapter 2, verse 8, the words of the first and the last, the one who died and came to life. Why did Jesus describe himself this way? The first and the last, 
the one who died and came to life. He references his sovereignty as a remedy for the temporary pains of this life. And Spurgeon had said, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. So what if God's presence, comfort, love for us was so great that even in the most difficult trial, it was as comforting as the pillow you lay your head on? If he's the first and the last, who are we to worry and fret and fear about what we might endure here? It's easier to say now when there's not much coming our way. But what happens in the next five to ten years? We see how quickly things are moving in our culture. What happens if we really, really need to rest on the sovereignty of God? I would suggest practicing it now in even the small trials. John Wesley said, I judge all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. I judge all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. What in your life has value in eternity? And it's going to be the good works you do for Jesus, but it's also going to be the persecution you face for Jesus. Those things, the hardships, actually will have more value in eternity than some of your successes, I think, because you're enduring for Christ and you're knowing him in the fellowship of his sufferings. And Paul was happy, joyful to endure those things. The church in Smyrna was told at the very end excuse me, not at the very end, but to be faithful unto death. So God is calling us to have the same faithfulness. And uh, if he's the first and the last, the one who died and came to life, that means he's eternally sovereign over our world and over our lives, and he's given us complete victory over whatever might come our way. And that's good news in a world that has nothing but bad news, and we need to cling to it. Amen? All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for um, encouraging us day by day with your word, with your Holy Spirit, with Christian brothers and sisters, with this church. We know, Jesus, that you have called us to be faithful like the church in Smyrna, Lord. They were under persecution, they were under a pagan government, and they were under slander from religious zealots. But we know, Lord, that it isn't too different for us here. It just may not have sunk in yet. Prepare us for the hardships that may come, knowing that we have victory, Jesus. You rose from the grave and gave us life, Lord, and you are the Alpha and the Omega. So we know that resting in that is as comfortable as our pillow at home. Thank you, Jesus, for being so good to us and for rescuing us from uh, the hand of the devil. And we ask, Lord, if you have given him permission or an open door to bring attacks against us here at Emmanuel, um, that we will, we will rebuke them, but yet endure them because you have called us to um, be a light for you. And when we endure those, those struggles, your name is lifted up. Um, we're looking forward to the way that you continue to open our eyes to see the realities of the way we should operate here as your church. And uh, none of this is bad news, Jesus. It can be sobering, but it's not bad news, because we know that there's a crown of life waiting for us. Um, and the victory that uh, comes with your salvation is ours even at this moment. So let us walk in it. Um, and be an encouragement to this uh, community, to this world, and to one another. We pray in your name. Amen. Please stand and join us for the Lord's song.
That's a good point. Well, with all the struggles that might come, you better do it through Jesus' power, not your own. It's not going to work very well. We're going to pray before we go downstairs for our meal, and thank God for that. Jesus, thank you for another meal provided, especially blessings on the Cots family for bringing us such a special uh, time together. Um, give us a special time of fellowship, Lord, as we engage with one another and build each other up. We know that's important until you come, Father. Thank you for doing everything you've done for us. In your name, amen. Have a good week, and remember, you can't get in line until you're told.